our story so far has left Joseph in Egypt as Grand Vizier, second most powerful man in all of Egypt. To confirm the trust that Pharaoh has in Joseph, he gives him an Egyptian wife, Anaseth, the daughter of a priest of Amun, who bears two sons to Joseph while he's carrying out his duties for the king. As we said in our last blog, if this story were concerned only with Joseph, it could end here. But the story then leaves Joseph and returns to Jacob and Joseph's brothers in Canaan. It's now nine years into the period dreamed by Pharaoh and interpreted by Joseph, the second of the seven lean years, and there's a famine in Canaan too. Jacob has heard of about Egypt's storehouses, that they're full to overflowing, and so he sends 10 of his sons down to buy grain, keeping Benjamin, the other son of Rachel, at home, fearing that harm might befall him as it had Joseph if he lets him out of his sight. The 10 brothers make their way to Egypt and fall down before Joseph. Joseph recognizes them, but he doesn't let on that he does. He's no doubt very Egyptianized by this time, and nearly 20 years have passed since the brothers last saw him. So the brothers don't recognize him. We're told that Joseph thinks of his dreams, but he treats his brothers roughly, accusing them of being spies come to see the weakness of the land. The brothers claim that they can't be spies since they're a family and no sensible leader would send a family on a spy mission since the entire family would be wiped out if anything goes wrong. The brothers are right about that. Years later, when Joshua sends spies into Canaan, he sends one person from each tribe, uh, no two people even from the same tribe. But Joseph says he doesn't know that they're all parts of the same family. And so they explain that they were 12 brothers. One is gone, and the last is with their father. Joseph then tells them that they can prove that they're really a family by bringing their brother down to Egypt with them. Bringing someone with them who calls himself a brother would of course not prove anything. And anyway, Joseph knows that they're telling the truth. So he seems to be doing something other than what he says he's doing. To show his brother that he's, brothers that he's serious about his suspicions, he throws all of them in jail for three days. And when he releases them, he sends nine of the brothers home and keeps Simeon as a hostage to guarantee that they'll come back with their brother. We don't have access to Joseph's mind or thoughts during any of this. We have only what he says and does, and we have to infer from them what we can about what Joseph is really up to. We can guess that part of his motivation is plain old revenge. His brother sold him into slavery years ago, and that he succeeded in Egypt beyond anyone's expectations is no thanks to them. So he accuses and threatens them and then throws them into prison for three days to make them sweat a little bit. And when he releases them, he confirms that he will keep Simeon and he will never send them another grain of wheat or barley if they don't bring their brother with them next time. Another likely part of Joseph's motivation here is that he really wants to see Benjamin, his only full brother, but he goes about it in a most oblique way. By the time he sends the nine brothers home, he knows that the brothers have changed, that they're no longer the same hate-driven gang who threw him into the pit and let the Midianites sell him into slavery. He knows that because he's been talking to them through an interpreter, as though he doesn't speak their language which means that when they talk among themselves, he can overhear and, and understand what they're saying. What he overhears is the brothers trying to figure out why they're being treated so badly. And when they say, in truth, we were guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he besought us and we would not listen. Therefore is this distress come upon us. When Joseph hears that, um, he has to turn away because he's crying. And then, however, he turns back to them and continues to abuse them. Some readers have guessed that at this point, Joseph really doesn't know what he wants to do or what he should do. 
All he has to go on are the dreams of his brothers bowing down to him. But both dreams had 11 sheaves or stars bending low to him. And the second included his father and mother as well. There are only 10 of, of them in front of him now. And perhaps when the 11th joins them, maybe even his father, then he'll know what to do next. Thomas Mann in his Joseph and his brothers suggests that all along, Joseph has a sense that he has a special destiny, a mission to fulfill based both on his dreams and on the fantastic luck that has reversed the course of his life three times, each time when everything seemed hopeless. But Mann also thinks that Joseph never quite understood what that destiny and mission was. And based on the way Joseph behaves both this time and the next time when the brothers return with Benjamin, that's a plausible inference. Anyway, there must have been a lot going on in Joseph's heart and mind. The need for revenge, the desire to see Benjamin and his father again, joy over his brother's repentance, and maybe even uncertainty as to how and where to go from here, and not knowing for sure what all of this is really about. Anyway, he sends uh, his brothers home to get Benjamin, except for Sibian, whom he keeps as a hostage. But when the brothers get home and tell Jacob what they're supposed to do, he says, there's no way he's letting Benjamin go to Egypt. He says, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. But the famine continues, and soon all of the grain they've brought back has been used up, and Jacob says they have to go back and get more. But they say they don't dare go back unless Benjamin goes with them. Jacob holds out for a long time, but it's Judah who finally talks him into letting Benjamin go. Judah says to his father, I will be surety for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. What Joseph offers here is to bear the guilt if anything happens to Benjamin. And it would no doubt cost Judah his chance for the birthright blessing if the worst happens to Benjamin and he doesn't return. He's risking a lot to make this pledge. But he also reminds Jacob that he too is going to have to risk what is most precious to him in order to save his large extended family and his posterity and the fulfillment of Yahweh's promise to Abraham. So in an interesting way, this is Jacob's test too, like Abraham's when he's asked to sacrifice Isaac. And Jacob finally and reluctantly agrees. So all the brothers go back to Egypt. And now Joseph has 11 kneeling to him, and he still seems unsure of what to do next. We're told that his heart aches and that he has to keep excusing himself to go out of his room to weep, but he still doesn't do the one thing that we're expecting. That is, tell them who he is. Because the next thing he does is to play a trick on Benjamin, putting up his own cup in Benjamin's sack of grain and then sending the police out when the brothers start for home, arresting Benjamin and bringing him back as Joseph's personal slave for life. The other brothers are told that they can continue on their journey home, but they all returned with Benjamin. Maybe Benjamin, maybe Joseph is trying to see if to save their own skins, they'll sacrifice Jacob's favorite son, the way years ago they sold the favorite son into slavery. But by now that seems unnecessary since from what he's overheard from his brothers and from his own responses to what he has heard, he's already convinced that they won't. And of course he knows that Benjamin is innocent because he's the one who put the cup in, brother, in the, his brother's sack. Joseph seems to be waiting for some signal, some sign, some word, some key that will tell him how to bring this story to resolution. And then Judah provides the key. He first reviews all the steps which brought them here. And then he says, now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, as his life is bound up in the lad's life, when he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. 
for your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame in the sight of my father all my life. Now, therefore, let your servant, by which, of course, he means himself, now, therefore, let your servant, I pray you, remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go back with his brothers. Or how can I go back to my father if the lad is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would come upon my father. And then everything becomes clear to Joseph as well as to us. Earlier, Judah told his father that sometimes one has to risk what one holds most dear to save the family and the promise of Yahweh. And here he shows that he means it by offering up his own freedom to protect and save his father. It's Judah's best moment in the story, and it also makes clear to Joseph what all these events had been about. Because immediately after Judah's speech, Joseph then tells them who he is, and then he uses Judah's explanation when he says, sounding as though it's a revelation, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Thanks to Judah's offer, Joseph, maybe for the first time, understands what Jacob has done with Benjamin and what he did without knowing it with Joseph years ago and what Judah has offered to do with himself and what God did with Joseph, sending the favored one, the privileged son, risking him, offering him up to save his people. So this isn't just Joseph's story. It's Judah's too, because it helps to explain how Judah earned the blessing, the birthright, how he became the bearer of the promise made to Abraham. On his deathbed years later, after Jacob explains that Reuben, Simeon, Levi have eliminated themselves from receiving the blessing, he says, Judah, your brother shall praise you, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, your father's son shall bow down before you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. We know that Judah's son will become the ancestor of Boaz, the husband of Ruth, whose grandson will be Jesse of Bethlehem, whose youngest son was another beautiful, amazing boy who played the harp, killed giants with a slingshot, and already, had already by then been secretly anointed as king, King David. So this is Judah's story too, and a story about God's people. Finally, I think that this story has another resonance for us. Patriarchs and some other characters in the Old Testament seem in many ways privileged participants in history because Yahweh's always there appearing to them, showing them things and talking to them and helping them out and telling them what things mean. The same will be true later on for Moses and Joshua and still later for some of the prophets. For them, Yahweh is so imminent that they could actually have chats with him. They can even argue with him. For J Joseph and Jacob and Judah, however, this isn't true. God is not present in the same way for them that he was for those other characters. He doesn't even appear directly in the Joseph story. He does send dreams, but dreams are tricky things and even if one's sure that Yahweh has sent the dream, one still needs to work out its meaning for oneself and then decide what to do about it. So Jacob and Joseph and Judah in this story have to do pretty much what we all have to do, to keep on keeping on doing what we think is the right thing while trying to figure out what our mission is and what our task is and how it fits into a larger scheme and what that larger scheme really is. We could see the hand of Yahweh in the story because we're privileged spectators, because as readers, 
we are privileged spectators. But Jacob and Joseph and Judah have to figure it out for themselves, and they have to help each other do it, working in the hopes that there will be some defining moment when the whole picture comes into focus. So I think that we can know what it feels like to be the characters in the story and to share with them their griefs and visions and insights. In another, it's another way in which the story of Joseph and his brothers speak to us across the great valley of time.